Here's a question uh, for us this morning. Why doesn't God do something uh, about it? I'm sure it's a question that you've asked at one time or another. You know, you see things that are not as they could be. You see things that are not as they should be. And you ask that question, why doesn't God do something about it? Perhaps, you know, just the, the interview that Matt just shared with us, the stuff that's going on in his school and in that community. And that, that's not how things could be. That's not how things should be. Why doesn't God do something about that? If God is real, if God is loving, if God is compassionate, why doesn't he do something about this? Whatever it is, uh, and I'm sure you, there's moments in your life where you've seen something, you've encountered something, you've experienced something, you've witnessed something, and you've asked yourself th- this question. Wherever you are on this journey of faith, whether you've been following Jesus for many years or, or you're not even sure that, um, that God is real, that Jesus is who he claims to be, I'm sure you've thought um, a question uh, like this. And the thing is, we know what we would do if we were God in those situations. We know how we would act. We know how we would intervene to address the imbalance or to address the injustice. And we would do something about it now, straight away, uh, immediately. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why many people struggle in their faith or, or stall in their faith or actually lose their faith um, altogether. Maybe that's, maybe that's you. Maybe you've encountered something or experienced something and you wanted God to do something about it and he didn't, he didn't act in the way that you thought he should do when you thought he should have done it. And so you sort of like, well, is God real? Can I, can I follow God? Can I, can I love God? Because God doesn't seem to be doing things anything about the, these things. It's why so many people have re-evaluated uh, their faith, and I understand uh, why that is. I understand why we experience that or struggle with some of those things. We're going to pick that up a little bit as we go through this morning, but we're carrying on this series called The Fundamentalist. Uh, we're trying to recover the essentials um, of our faith. We're trying to sort of look at, well, what are the things, when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, what are the things that somebody must believe in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus? There's so many things that come under the the banner of the Christian faith, so many traditions and ways to approach things. But, but what is essential? What is fundamental? What is core? What is central? And, and what's peripheral? You know, it might be important, but actually it's not fundamental. It's not actually something that is primary. It, it's secondary. And we wanted to sort of be able to identify those things, not to say that these secondary things aren't important, but so that we can focus on, well, this is important. This is primary. This is fundamental. This is what it means, or this is what we, you need to believe, actually, if you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus. And so far on our fundamental list, we started here, Jesus is God's Son and our King. Everything else on our list flows from this point. This is what Jesus claimed about himself. And if we want to be faithful followers of Jesus, we have to believe Jesus is who he believes that he is. And as Jesus is, uh, as God's final king, Jesus came to illustrate and demonstrate what God is like. You know, who is God and what is God like isn't, isn't a mystery to us anymore. We, that's been revealed to us through the person of Jesus. Jesus said to his followers, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He, he came to teach us and, and show us that this is who God is. This is what God um, is like. And then last week, we looked at this, that Jesus defines sin as anything that harms you or others. You know, sin isn't about... Or avoiding sin isn't about following a bunch of rules. Avoiding sin is about following the person of Jesus. And sin is anything that we do that harms us. Sin is anything that we do that harms other people. And that's why God is so anti-sin, because he is so for you. When we sin, we hurt ourselves, we damage ourselves, or the people around us. And God is so for us that he doesn't want us to do that. If you've missed any of those, you can catch up um, on our YouTube channel or at the Hub. Um, Just click on Sunday and you can see the last messages uh, from there. But the thing that we're going to look at today is we're going to carry on from here, um, and it's one of those things that's part of the Christian faith that, that also has lots of peripheral and secondary and cultural and also traditional things that are attached into it. And it can be quite difficult for us to separate, well, what is fundamental and what is sort of peripheral in this area? And it's the juicy subject of Final judgment. Oh, 
You, I mean, not, not even the image? That doesn't, I mean, oh, okay. There you go. It's a juicy one. So let's buckle ourselves up. You know, let's strap in uh, and let's jump back to that first question that we asked. Why doesn't God do something about You know, we all ask it, we all feel it, we all all experience it at one time or another. And the reason we ask this question is because we encounter, we experience, we witness, we see something that isn't right. We see something that isn't as it could be. We see something that isn't as it should be. And so we push back against it. We rebel against it. We resist it because this thing that's not right falls short of the ideal. You know, it doesn't measure up to how we think things should be. And when something that isn't right, when something that's falls short of this ideal, we complain. You know, we complain to God, God, why don't you do something about this? And when people do something that's not right, when people act or behave or say something in a way that falls short of this ideal, we complain. Not to them, you know, behind their backs, and we gossip about them, obviously, because that's what we, what we do. And we do other things. You know, when people fall short of this ideal, we judge them. We make assumptions about who they are and their character and their values uh, and their worth. And we bring sometimes this to, towards God, and we want God to do something about this. We want God to bring justice into those situations. But just as long as that justice and what God does doesn't impact our freedom. You know, we want God to do something about it, but we want him to do something about it to them. We don't want him to do something about it to us that causes us to change or impacts our sense of freedom or or free will or anything like that. And, you know, the first book that we come to in the Bible is a book called Genesis. Um, It brilliantly paints the picture. um, Some of you are getting the joke, but some of you are like too young to understand it. It brilliantly paints the picture um, of what happens when when this this ideal and, and something falls short of it, that something's not right. And it didn't take long actually for the ideal to be breaking, broken. And so God inter- intervened. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be a Christian or a Jesus follower to be familiar with the story of Noah and the ark and, and the flood. Actually, um, pretty much all ancient people groups, ancient cultures and traditions have some sort of flood narrative in their history and in, in their origin. So the story of Noah and the flood it is, is familiar with us, whether we've been in church all our life or, you know, this is the first time we've walked through the doors. And what the story of Noah and the flood tells us or how Genesis um, portrays this image is that things got so bad that God wanted to hit the reset button. He wanted to start again. And I wonder if Noah or I wonder if somebody else asked this question, you know, why doesn't God do something about this? You know, can't God see how bad it is? Can't God see how bad they are, what they're saying or what they're doing? Why doesn't God do something about it? And God did. And, and I'm guessing they weren't happy with, with what God did. And, you know, this is true for us. You know, we want God to do something about things. We want judgment. We want justice. But we want it to go our way. We want it on our terms. We want it for us and against other people. Now, the story um, of Noah and the flood is the fourth story um, in the, the book of Genesis. And it flows from the, the first three. We've got um, the, God creating the heavens and the earth, Adam and Eve. And, you know, this is where the ideal is broken. We've got a story about Cain and Abel. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. And then we've got a story of Noah um, and the, the flood. And these four stories are, are fundamental. They're foundational to what happens in the rest of the book of Genesis. And indeed, what happens throughout the rest of the Bible. But here's the thing. You know, you don't have to believe that these stories or all of these stories are literal in order to be a faithful follower of Jesus. You can believe that these are literal or you can believe that these are metaphorical. You know, whether they literally happened or they're painting a picture of something else that happened um, isn't fundamental to us being a faithful follower of Jesus. Whether these things literally happened or they're painting a picture of something else that happened doesn't impact that first thing on our fundamental list that Jesus is God's son and our king. And I know mature 
of faithful followers of Jesus who think, yeah, who believe that these things literally happened, or I know mature faithful followers of Jesus who think that these things are metaphorical, that they're painting a picture um, of something happened. You know, that's not the important thing, but, but the, the story that they're portraying, that the message that they're portraying is really important. So let's just spend a bit of time talking about Cain and Abel. They're the, the sons um, of Adam and Eve. Um, you know, Cain, it, Cain is the older and Abel is the younger. And it says this. So now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. So Abel is a shepherd and Cain is a farmer. Both of these jobs are really important in an agricultural society. And in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, you know, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. So, you know, they bring these offerings of, of what they've done to God. And we don't really know why, because at this point, God hasn't asked for it. It just sort of seems a natural response uh, for, for what they do. And, you know, so Cain brings some of the, the fat portions from the firstborn, and, and Cain brings some of the fruits of the soil. And, you know, again, in this culture, in this tradition, the fat portions were thought of as the best, and the firstborn was thought of as the best. So what um, Abel is doing is he's bringing God the first and the best of what he has. And, and Cain seems to be giving, you know, well, what's, what's left and, and keeping the best for himself. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with, with favor. You know, God is judging their sacrifices. He's looking at Abel's, and he's saying, look, what you've done is favorable. That's why it's called Abel, favorable, favor, uh, no, okay, it's a bad joke. Uh, and he looks at Cain, and, and he's not pleased. He doesn't look with, with favor uh, on Cain's um, offering. And, and this isn't about what they've um, presented. It's not about, you know, that God's more interested in meat than he is about vegetables. That's not what's going there at all. This is about the attitude and the intent behind these offerings. You know, um, God is pleased with, atti um, with Abel's attitude, and he's not pleased with Cain's attitude. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. You know, isn't this what happens when we feel judged? Isn't this what happens when, when we feel that we haven't measured up to the mark? We feel, we feel shame. We feel embarrassed. But instead of doing something about it, instead of raising our hands and saying, yeah, okay, that's true, I, I, I can see how I can improve or how I can grow in that area, you know, we just get angry. Uh, we, you know, our face becomes, uh, comes down, downcast, and, and we want to justify ourselves. We want justice, but we want it for us. Let's read on. Then the Lord said to Cain, you know, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Now, now God knows the answer to this question. He's asking Cain a, a question that he already knows the answer to. And I think what he's doing here is giving Cain the opportunity to own it, to, to, to admit to himself and, and before God, yeah, this is why I'm angry, and actually to do something about it, to make a, a, a change. Uh, but, well, we'll read what happens. But, but where is his anger directed? You know, Cain's angry in this moment. Who is he angry with? Is he, is he angry with himself for not doing what he knows he should have done or, or what he could have done? Is he angry with God because God um, is in looking with favor upon his offering? Or is he angry with his brother because his brother has come out on top and, and God is pleased with, with his younger brother and he's not pleased uh, with him? You know, in this place, God, God is... Um, giving Cain an opportunity to make a change. His anger should be directed to himself. This is within his control. He's done these things. He can actually do something um, about it. You know, God says, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And so, so God in this conversation states the obvious to Cain. Cain, do what is right, uh, and all will be well. But, but if you don't, you'll be consumed by it. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires uh, to have you. And God's sort of like giving this sort of warning to Cain. Look, you need to do something uh, about this. Just, just do what is right, and all will be well. But, but if you don't, if you allow this anger to continue to fester within you, if you don't control it, it is going to control you. It is going to consume 
you. And, you know, the source of Cain's anger is his brother. The source of Cain's anger is the comparison with his brother, that his brother is being told that like, he's the good one or he's done something that's very poor and you haven't. Now, what Cain is hearing in this engagement is, why can't you be more like your brother? Anybody ever said something like that to you or your sister? Have you ever, who's, who's had that? Um, just three people. I mean, I've had that. People would have said to me, why can't you be more like your sister um, when, I, when I was growing up? And do you know what? That is such an inspiring message to give. You know, when people said to me, what, Chris, why can't you be more like your sister? I'm like, you've got a point. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to get my homework in, in on time. I'm going I'm to be the best version of myself. Do you think that's true? No, you know, I don't do that. that. That message, whether, you know, people actually literally said that to me. I mean, they said this to my brother, you know, you know why can't, Tim, why can't you be more like your brother, Chris? Uh, but when I hear that, it didn't inspire me, it didn't encourage me. Actually, it made me feel uh, more, more angry. And maybe, you know, something else has happened. Maybe people didn't say these exact words, but, but they did something else. You know, they pray somebody in front of you. You know, maybe, you know, husbands, maybe your wife praised the husband of their friend, saying, oh, he's such a good guy. He's always buying her flowers and doing romantic gestures. Or, or maybe your kids have praised their friend's dad. Oh, you know, so-and-so's dad is so cool. He does this and he, he does that. And when things like that happen, or, or maybe it's a colleague. Somebody praised a colleague at work and said, oh, they've done such a great job. They're really, they're smashing it out of the park. You know, what we hear in those moments is, you're not as good as. There you go. Thank you. Muriel, is that you again? Outrageous. I mean, you know, who's, who's ever felt this? Whether it's been spoken to you literally, <laughs> I don't know, um, or, or somebody said something and you've interpreted it that way. Who, who's felt that they, somebody, put your hands up, own it, come on, a few, few of us, excellent. Yeah, I feel that often, you know, you're not as good as, and again, what happens in those moments? Well, what happens for me, and I'm guessing it happens for you, is I, I feel a little bit angry, I feel a little bit um, annoyed, I feel a little bit, a bit, bit jealous, but in those moments, I'm presented with a choice. This is exactly what's going on in Cain. You know, he, he's hearing this, you're not as good as your brother um, in those things, and he's presented with a choice, and, and I'm presented with a choice in, in those moments. I can do what is right, and I will be blessed, or I can do what is wrong, and it will consume me. You know, in those moments when you feel this, whether somebody has said this to you or intended it or not, you're presented with a choice. You, you know, you can either allow that to consume you or you can choose to be challenged by it. You can choose to be inspired by it. You can choose to see the truth in it, even if it's just a grain of truth and be inspired to grow. Or you can do what Cain did. Now, Cain said to his brother, Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and he killed him. Now, okay, we might not do exactly this, and I'm hoping you don't do, uh, to do this thing. This is a very extreme response, but we do something similar. You know, we try and remove the comparison. We try and discredit the other person. We try and, and pick faults or wrong spot. We, we see a flaw, and, and we try and highlight that in, in a way to actually make us feel better that they're not perfect um, either. And if we can find something that's wrong with them, we can distract, discredit them, and that comparison goes away. We, we highlight like past uh, mis mistakes, we point to those things that uh, are not per perfect, and, and we're trying to do that to make ourselves feel better. Cain did the same thing, but you know, he, and then some. He took his brother out to the field and he killed him. And you know, God comes to him and says, "Cain, where's your brother Abel?" "I don't know," he replied. "Am I my brother's keeper?" You know. That's a phrase that we use time and time again um, in life. Maybe if you've never been in church before, growing up in church, you might, not, you might be surprised that, that that phrase comes from the Bible. Am I my brother's keeper? And God asks this question, you know, Cain, where is your brother Abel? God knows the answer to the question. So why is he asking it? Well, again, I think he's giving Cain an opportunity to own up to what he's done, to, to admit his mistake and to start that path um, of restoration. Um, but Cain uh, doesn't, you know, it, 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 you know he, I'm on my brother's keeper. He, he, he doesn't own up. He doesn't admit to it. And God knows what's going on. And he says this, the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, I mean, listen to these words. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. 
Now you're under a curse and you're driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. You know, Cain's job, he, he looks after uh, the, the, the ground. He, he plants and, and he, he reaps the harvest. And God is saying, that's not going to be the case for you. You know, this is judgment. Um, this is the consequence that God has put on Cain for what Cain has done. But does anybody else think that Cain has got off lightly here? You know, he's killed his brother, and he's not willing to admit it, and God has basically sacked him, taken away his job and, and perhaps um, his life. You know, if, if it was up to me, if I was God, um, I would have done something very different. I know what I would do uh, in that moment, but it, but it seems that, that Cain has gotten off lightly. But, but funny enough, you know, as we read on, Cain doesn't think he's gotten off lightly. He said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you're driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence. I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. And you can start to see, well, maybe this is, is a severe uh, punishment. Maybe this is a severe consequence. You know, um, he's still got his life, but he's lost everything that was his life. He's lost his family. He's lost his, his job. He's lost his identity. And if Abel's family, if Abel's um, and, um, you know, that, that wider people find him, they're going to kill him. That He's going to lose his life again. They will avenge him. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. Now, I don't know what this means. I don't know literally what, what's going on here. But what I can see is that God's saying, no, people won't kill you, Cain. And, and what, however he does that, God does that. But why does God do this? Is this justice? You know, does the family of Abel not have the, the right to avenge their, fa their father? On face value, this seems like an amazing act of grace towards Cain, who's done nothing to deserve that grace. But actually, as you delve into it, I think this is an amazing act of grace towards the family of Abel. Because if they come across Cain, they will want to avenge Abel for what Cain has done. They will want to kill him. They want to take justice onto their own hands. And if they do that, they become consumed by it. They'll become like Cain. They will do what's not, not, what's not right. And sin will be crouching at their door, wanting to control them, wanting to consume them. You see, the thing about judgment is it's a divine attribute. Judgment, true judgment, comes from God. It's his responsibility because he is the only person who is just enough to deliver true judgment. He is the only person who is just enough to deliver true justice. And the thing about judgment, you know, true judgment, divine judgment, is it has two parts. There's, there's retribution and there's restoration. Um, and the thing about um, this retribution and this restoration is, uh, you know, when we go seeking um, judgment for ourselves, we just seek retribution, not restoration. We want to get even. We want uh, to right the wrong that has happened, uh, and we want to make amends for it. We want to settle the score. And we do those things that might make us feel that we've gotten even. We might settle the score, but the, in the end, it's still broken, and now we are broken also. So we don't seek restoration um, in those moments. And this is the whole thing about judgment. This is why it's difficult, and this is why um, it, it can be messy at times. When people do stuff um, against us, and we seek, well, we want to get even with them. And God, why aren't you doing something um, a, a, about that? Well, the thing is, God is. God is doing something about that. God is doing something about Cain and Abel, but he's also doing something about those situations in your life where you seek this and you want retribution. You want to get even because of what have they said or what they've done to you or somebody who is close to you. Now, this all stuff happened thousands of years ago, but let's jump forward a few thousand uh, years again um, to the first thing on our fundamental list. You know, Jesus is God's son and our king, and as God's final king, Jesus gets the final say. You know, he picks up the, the mantle of, of being judge. He's the one who's able um, to actually do this properly. And so uh, let's take a look at something that Jesus said about himself, something else that Jesus said about himself, which sheds some more light on this whole judgment thing. You know, Jesus, John's recording this for us. Jesus says, The Father judges no one. 
but he's entrusted all judgment to the Son. This is what Jesus says about himself. The Father is not judging anyone. He has passed that responsibility on to me. You know, it's his job. It's Jesus' job. And if we're honest, you know, we don't really know what that looks like. And we think we do. And this is where all this sort of cultural and peripheral stuff comes into this. Because as soon as you start thinking about, about judgment and, and those things, we, we, we think, well, we know how judgment will be served. And we throw around destinations like heaven and hell. You know, we, we think, well, this is a place in and, and, and this final judgment. Well, good people are going to go to heaven and, and bad people are going to go to hell. And of course, we put ourselves in the heaven group and we put those people in the hell group. And we might not ever say that out loud, but we might think it um, if we're, we're honest. And, you know, if we were in charge, we'd know who would let into this group, into the heaven group. And we'd know who we send to the hell group, the people who've wronged us or the people who wronged the people uh, who we care about. And the, the reality is, we don't really know a lot about this, or certainly about this. You know, the Bible actually doesn't talk a lot um, about that as much as we might think uh, it, it, it does. We do not get to be the ones to decide what happens here. You know, that's beyond our pay grade. That, that's up to God. We don't know what will happen. We don't know how that will unfold. We don't know, you know, who goes there and all those sort of things. What we do know is that judgment will happen. What we do know is that justice will happen. Let's take a look at these words that a guy called Paul wrote. He said, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You know, Paul says we must all appear. Who do you think Paul's referring to when he says all? There, what do you reckon? All. Oh, that's interesting. I'm, see, I thought when Paul says we must all, I thought he meant them. I thought he meant the people who'd done something wrong, who'd, who'd upset me or offended me or hurt me or the people I love. But, but that's a great point because when Paul says all, he also says each of us. I, I think he actually means me. I think he actually means you, that, that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What, what is that? What does that look like? When does that happen? I don't know. We haven't got that that information. Each of us may receive what is due for the things that that we've done while in this body, that that we will be judged on what we've said and what we thought and what we've acted whilst alive, whilst in this body, whether they're good or bad. How does that unfold? How does that work itself out? I don't know. This throws up so many questions for me that I haven't got time to go into. But what I do know is that judgment will happen and justice will happen. I know that I will stand before God, I'll stand before Jesus, and I I will be judged. That makes me feel uncomfortable. But I also know the people who have wronged me and hurt me and offended me and upset me, or the people that I love, they too will stand before Jesus one day and be judged. So what, what, what does that mean? What, what, what do we do in response to that? Well, let's get the band back up as we just wrap up this time. This is the fourth thing on our fundamental list. Jesus promised justice in the end, and he invites us to trust him in the meantime. You know, Jesus promised justice in the end, and he invites us to trust him in the meantime. What does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is, who's on your retribution list? Who's on your list? I'm, I'm sure you haven't got a list of people like retribution list, and I hope you haven't. Uh, but maybe there's people that come to mind who, who have wronged you, have harmed you, or who have hurt you. And they're on your list because you want to get even um, with them for what they've done. And do you know what? If they had done to me what they've done to you, I'd want to do exactly the same thing. I'd want to get even. I'd want to settle the score. But what we see through, through the story of Cain and Abel and so many other stories throughout, throughout the unfolding narrative of Scripture is that when we do that, when we seek justice and judgment on our terms, when we take that into our hands, it doesn't end well. It doesn't go well. It doesn't settle the score. You know, Jesus promised justice in the end, and he invites us to trust him in, in the meantime. And the thing is, he knows he knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're experiencing. He knows what you're, you've gone through. He knows what they've done. And he says, I'm at work. I will deal with it. I will make it right. Again, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that's involved. And he says, trust me in the meantime. Leave the judging to me. I'm better at it than you. And that challenges me. Um, it, it provokes me. And I think, what do I do with that? 
Do I actually choose to trust him or do I choose to take it on myself and, and gossip or wrong spot or try and bring other pe- people down? Uh, and you know what? There's so many things uh, in this whole judgment and justice and, and final judgment thing. It's a big topic and, and we're actually going to pick this up um, next week because there's a, there's a really important aspect that comes to this. You know, how do we actually leave it to him? How do we trust him in the meantime? Well, there's these two words, grace and forgiveness, that we receive from him. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, and somehow, you know, we've done this and, you know, this may be what we deserve, but somehow we receive grace and forgiveness from him. And this is the really challenging thing, and and we'll spend a little bit of time looking at this next week. Jesus invites us, as we trust him, to extend that grace and that forgiveness to other people. And I know that's difficult. I know that's hard, and and I don't know what it is that people have done or or said to you, and in some situations, this is really difficult, and it can be, be messy, and that's why we're not gonna dive into it just here. But what Jesus does say is, I know I will work trust me in the meantime and we receive that grace we'll receive that forgiveness and we'll pick that up again next week why don't we stand to our feet father god i thank you that um you are so above us and so beyond us that there's so many things about following you that we can't comprehend and i thank you for that you know if we could fully fathom you if we could fully contain you we could fully grasp you you wouldn't be god I pray that you'd help us to trust you. I pray that you'd help us to put our faith in you. And for those of us who, this is a big deal, it's a big issue because of what people have said or what people have done. Help us. Give us your grace. Give us your forgiveness. And give us that ability to trust you, to hand the judgment and the justice over to you because we recognize you're better at it than us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.